Uh, my name is Paul Weston. I represent the International Free Press Society uh, in England. And I'm standing here today because our liberal elites have betrayed Europe to Islam. They have betrayed us totally. Forty-two years ago, a very famous British politician, Enoch Powell, made his famous Rivers of Blood speech, in which he stated, the supreme function of statesmanship is to provide against preventable evils. Our politicians today do the exact opposite. They actively promote in Europe today a preventable evil. Eighty years ago, one man, Winston Churchill, was very clear about preventing a clear and present danger, Mr. Hitler and the Nazis. But Churchill at the time was a lone voice, crying in the wind of appeasement. And the carnage, and it was carnage, that happened could have been avoided. It could have been avoided, but they did not listen to him, and the carnage came with a vengeance. Europe today is in much the same position. Islam is growing demographically, territorially, and militantly, and all the while this is happening, it is promoted as the religion of peace by the same cowardly, careerist politicians who once appeased Hitler. Islam is not and was never the religion of peace. Winston Churchill describes it as a religion of blood and war. Islam, <coughs> anyone with a knowledge of the foundations and history of Islamic expansion knows this is the truth. Muhammad was a warlord and a very good warlord. By the time of his death, he had militarily defeated and converted most of the pagan and Christian tribes of the Arabian Peninsula. And after his death, Islam rapidly expanded, not peacefully, but at the, port, at the point of a sword, defeating ancient civilizations and overrunning continents as it did so. And it's here today, within Europe, within the West, and it's calling for what it has always called for, total Islamic domination, and if we wish to resist this, they will use terror against us. Yet still, our treasonous politicians call it the religion of peace. And they tell us that if we refuse to share such a fantastical and ridiculous notion, if we choose to believe Winston Churchill's argument that Islam is a religion of blood and war, then we will be sent to prison for saying this. Of course it is not a religion of peace. Its founder was a warrior and the highest honour bestowed upon a Muslim is the promise of 75 scented virgins and eternal leg over in the afterlife, <laughs> achievable not by being a good Samaritan, but by dying as a martyr in the physical battle to expand imperialist Islam. <laughs> Islam literally means submission. What sort of religion defines itself by the word submission? Islam divides the world into two spheres, the house of Islam and the house of war. What religion defines itself by military conquest? Yet our leaders tell us we cannot criticize Islam because it's a religion. Whilst the organization of the Islamic Conference in cahoots with the United Nations now tries to make any criticism of Islam illegal. But Islam is not just a religion. It is a political, social, legal and structural blueprint which totally dominates every devout Muslim's life and wishes, coincidentally, to dominate yours as well. It is profoundly illiberal. It is profoundly undemocratic. It does not believe in the man-made laws of democracy, preferring instead to adhere to the absolute word of Allah as interpreted by an illiterate 7th century desert dweller. And our politicians have imported this illiberal and undemocratic ideology into the liberal democracies that make up the West today and then they dare to criminalize us when we object to this. 
How can we not criticise Islam? How can our politicians put this above criticism? When homosexuals are hung from cranes in Iran, is this political Islam or is this religious Islam? When adulterous women are buried up to their shoulders in sand and stoned to death, is this political Islam or is this religious Islam? When Muslims who wish to leave Islam are issued with death sentences, is this political Islam or religious Islam? When wives and daughters are slaughtered to protect their family's honour by husbands, fathers and uncles, is this political Islam or is this religious Islam? If it is political, then it must be denounced as evil and barbaric. If it is religious, how could it possibly not be denounced the same way? What is evil is evil. What is barbaric is barbaric. And it cannot be exempted from criticism by sheltering under the word religion. In criminalising our free speech, our socialist leaders reveal their dictatorial ambition as well. The mark of a free society is freedom of speech. To take this away from us is a totalitarian act and it's made much, much worse because our only defence in the peaceful opposition against the foreign totalitarian ideology of Islam is free speech. And I hope this irony is not lost on you. In order to protect and advance a foreign totalitarian ideology, our own rulers are prepared to adopt a native totalitarianism to stop us defending our democracy and our freedom. The West lives in accordance with the European Convention on Human Rights. Islam does not. They signed up to the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam. But they have a very important caveat. When Sharia law collides with human rights law, Sharia law always prevails. This is like a signatory to the Geneva Convention murdering and torturing prisoners of war and being given a total pass at a war trial because it was apparently part of their religion. And when our politicians today excuse Islam as the religion of peace and allow them to set the rules at home, at the European Union and at the United Nations, then our politicians are betraying their countries, they are betraying their people and they are committing treason. Can you commit treason in a time of peace? But are we really at peace? We may not consider ourselves at war with Islam, but Islam certainly considers itself at war with us. And it's a war that we are losing, territorially, democratically, politically, and above all, demographically. And it's a war of aggression on two fronts. Radical Islam on the one and left-wing treason on the other. Our children are told to celebrate multiculturalism and Islam without being told the real history of violent, expansionist and imperialist Islam. Instead, they're told that their history, their religion, their culture, their traditions, their very being is just a litany of imperialism, racism, murder and slavery. This is a proven psychological technique designed to render an enemy helpless. Or to quote Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in order to destroy a people, you must first sever their roots. And this is what our leaders are doing to us today. Can anyone really argue that a government that praises a foreign invader and strips away the defences of his people is a government that is not guilty of committing treason. Okay, very depressing. But now we come to a more uplifting part, because this part we're actually winning. Hurt Wilders here in the Netherlands, René Stadkowitz in Germany. The Sweden Democrats, Heinz Christian Stracker in Austria, the Swiss People's Party, and in England, we await patiently, but we await 
a political movement to pick up the baton from the English Defence League. And that growth, that growth in right-wing extremism is not the word, in right-wing-ism. People are becoming aware of Islam. They're becoming aware of the depths of treason perpetrated by our rulers. And most importantly, people are starting to lose their fear of being labelled a racist, which was a label specifically designed to strip us of any resistance against a racially designated invader who uses race as a weapon. Let's deal with this racist label. It is not racist to defend your country against an obvious and growing threat. It is not racist to defend your culture, your heritage and your traditions. It is not racist to work to ensure a democratic future for our children and our grandchildren. If you choose not to defend your country and your culture, if you choose not to defend the democratic future of your children, then you may well pat yourselves on your backs in your non-racist champagne socialist cocktail bars in Islington. You may well love other people's anti-racist credentials almost as much as you love your own, but there's no getting away from the label that I have for you. You are a traitor, a betrayer of your country, a betrayer of your culture and a betrayer of your yet unborn children. And you are a racist. You are a genocidal racist. Young native Europeans will become a demographic, ethnic minority within their own homelands if immigration rates and birth rates stay the way they are for just one more generation. This politely is called population replacement. More crudely, it is called genocide, and it is a bloodless genocide. The United Nations is very clear on this. Article 2 says, in the present convention, genocide means any of the acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, racial or religious group.